Life is hard for a weeb without weeb friends. I am a comic creator and an avid manga reader, and since I don't have any friends to talk to about reading or writing comics, I've decided to do the next best thing. Scream about my passions into the loveless void of the internet. Slightly more seriously. As a serial procrastinator, picking up the hobby of creating video essays will hopefully force me to take a more critical look at the media I consume in order to improve my craft. One of my artistic struggles is designing monsters. Anything outside of your cookie cutter werewolf or vampire has got me stumped on what to do. Luckily for me, this is not a universal issue. In manga, there are tons of examples of creators with amazingly imaginative monster designs. Jujutsu Kaisen, Chainsaw Man, Made in Abyss, anything by Junji Ito are the popular ones that come to mind. And today, I want to take a closer look at the monster designs of one of my favorite manga series, that being Berserk by the late Kento Mura. Looking at his work, I can see the inspiration of Maurits Escher and Hironamish Bosch. i so sorry for that pronunciation. However, as the uncultured swine that I am, I'm incapable of picking out any other influences on my own. I was not able to find any instances of Mira stating inspirations for his monster designs in particular either, so I'm just going to dive straight into general analysis. Though first, uh, light spoilers for Berserk I guess. I'm not going to talk about the story, but I am going to show and talk about a lot of monster designs from throughout the series, so you are warned. Also, unless stated otherwise, everything presented here is based off of my own analysis and does not necessarily reflect the original author, nor anyone else's thoughts. For this video, I reread Berserk, examining all the various monsters presented in order to find general trends in their appearances. Though there were no universal rules, I did find some repetition in the majority of monsters. The most prominent trend in the designs was some level of reflection of the human body. Even outside of the undead style creatures, it's common for there to be human-like bone structure. For instance, Zod, that goat guy from Conviction, or any of the god hand. However, even when the body wasn't a two-armed bipedal creature, there would still usually be human-like body parts. Eyes, hands, fingers, faces, stuff like that. Sometimes the human-like aspects are normal looking on an unhuman body. And sometimes aspects of them are staggered and deformed, most often the eyes and or mouth. Sometimes it would be both, particularly with faces, where there is both a fairly normal human face as well as a face with like staggered features. Lots of times it was just the mouth, but there were quite a few instances of it being two wholly separate faces. So we figured out about the human aspect, what other elements are present. When the monster was not a skeleton slash regular undead, it was usually mixed with either a large dangerous animal or some sort of bugs. The large predator or dangerous animals would bring more of an aggressive, intimidating threat to the monster, usually with bulky and solid shapes, the idea being to use human instincts to recognize, ah, a predator, I'm in danger. Insects, on the other hand, don't pose a physical threat to humans, generally speaking. They do, however, have much more unique appearances and the ability to create a disgusted reaction. The bug design seemed to capitalize on the more alien and creepy appearances to incite feelings of disgust and unease. I will say, the type of animals used is probably the least consistent of the general rules I found, as there are plenty of exceptions that are mixed with plants, sea creatures, non-large or dangerous mammals, and so on and so forth. The body shape is not the only contributing aspect to the designs, though. The way the monster is rendered also seems to be quite important. Mira uses lots of texture on the designs, highlighting bumps and veins and other imperfections along the monster's bodies. This also includes adding slimes or excretions to the skin. These gross tentacle growths seem to be a go-to for him. Whenever details were not present, it was almost always due to shadow obscurance rather than actual lack of texture or light obscurance. If you look at this panel from the Eclipse, you can see plenty of these observations put into use. On the left, there's an insect guy, maybe a centipede, with a clear insect face but also a clear human face in the center. In the middle, you get a large canine-like faced creature with tentacles coming out to pull a guy in. On the far right is a lizard with texture gross along the side of his face, think axolotl. Some dude bro fused to the top of him and human-like hands with bestial claws. Later in the series, inside of the troll den, 
you can see some monsters with a much calmer but also much more alien vibe. These monsters have got more of a flora theme as there are less animal fusions and more plant ones. We've got a bunch of berries with individual shadowy faces and a bunch of human arms popping out. Underneath, there's this long slug-like creature with lots of eyes and a long distorted mouth that tracks the whole length of its body. There are also these mushrooms with eyes along the edges and numerous human fingers poking out at the top. Outside of the builds, the way the creatures present themselves also seems to be quite helpful for the success of their designs. Slug Boy from the Black Swordsman arc? was, in fact, a slug, so, like, pretty gross as is. However, the gross elements were exemplified by how invasively he was presented. He's often presented hiding inside of people, touching people, coming in and out of their mouths, really making the audience simmer in and feel the discomfort. Another example of important presentation is Zod, always presented as in-between beast and man. He could be mistaken for a human when he's first presented, However, something's not quite right with his bestial eyes and wild, rough features. However, even when he changes to his beast form, he still keeps the echoes of humanity with his fairly humanoid face and body structure compared to the other monsters. All these trends can be mixed and matched to different degrees to different effects. There are three prominent examples from the series that I've got stuck in my mind right now. The first is Locus's monster design. His design is very unique and different from any of the other monsters in Berserk. There's plenty of the previously described features. He's got human-shaped torso with horse legs and very praying mantis-like shapes to his armor. However, unlike most of the monster designs, texture is abandoned for the sake of a very smooth and polished metal surface over his entire body. His design was polarizing amongst fans due to how different he looked from everyone else. The lack of textures lessens the gritty and grounded feel of the monster, instead giving him the distinct air of a cold, lifeless, and alien presence, unnerving in how it doesn't belong. The second monster design on my mind is the hung ghost that appears in the Millennium Falcon arc. These spirits hardly play a role, even so, this image here lives rent-free in the back of my mind. It stands there, feebly, willowy, and bathed in light normally ideal circumstances when presented with an unknown. Instead of the threat, it presents more of a melancholic unease, staring forward with its dark pits of eyes and mouth, with a body composed of shadows, free-floating in space, clearly present whilst being something that should not exist. Finally, the angel design from the Conviction arc are less memorable to me than the other two designs, but still interesting. They invoke a lot of traditionally angelic imagery to them, with the spotlight being shown upon them and large white wings trailing behind them. Their designs do a good job of highlighting contradictions with what would normally be a very angelic sight, which is twisted to some degree, not only by what we already know of them, but also visually because of all the detailed muscly sinew, weapons, and mishappened or obscured faces. I found the emphasis on human features in all the designs to be quite interesting. It's something I definitely think I've heard before, though I couldn't tell you where. After giving it some thought, it does make a lot of sense to me. Humans stand at both the top of the food chain and as the creature are both most familiar and intimate with. Every artist knows humans are harder to draw than any other animal due to people's ability to notice when things about it are wrong. The intimacy can result in both placing oneself in the shoes of the monster and further trying to understand them due to the glimpses of humanity, as well as the off-putting effects of the uncanny valley where the creature is almost human, but not quite. Perhaps a human narcissism in a way. We perceive ourselves as the greatest threat of all. Could I be off base with that? Sure, but I gotta rationalize somehow. In conclusion, the most important thing to remember seems to be intent and a willingness to mix things up. The features and elements used are done so very intentionally and chosen from a wide variety of inspirations in order to emphasize the roles, emotions, and themes of the individual monsters. I may not have Mira's artistic skill, but that does not mean I can't do my best to learn from his work and strive to the heights where him and the other greats like him stand. I am always open to other opinions and discussion, otherwise that will be all from me. Also, I guess it's worth noting, um, sorry about my voice, I sound pretty annoyed. Unfortunately, this is the only voice I have, so this is the voice I have to work with. Bye.